All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. Greetings and welcome to episode 429 of the KISS FAQ podcast. So we are back for another week. I will be your host this week, uh, sort of the, uh, you know, the, the backup host, as you may notice. Um, and I will be joined by my good friends this week. Uh, I am, after all, named on the board Mike, Marcus Almighty. I'm joined, of course, with my good friend Ken, 69th Blizzard on the board. Hello. And of course, our good friend from up in Sweden, Mr. Daniel. Welcome, Wheeze. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are, how are you guys doing this week? Everything okay? Yeah, yeah for sure, for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, things are, uh, you know, up here, winter is coming fast, so I'm guessing we'll get snow maybe in towards the end of October. So I'm trying to use this time to be outside and do stuff. Yeah, I I, I, I hear you. I mean, over here, it's still relatively <clears throat> decent, like 22, 23 degrees Celsius. Mm-hmm. But the colors are starting to change on the leaves here. And uh, the evenings are getting now, but I, I've had to switch out the air conditioning unit and turn on the heating now for nights. Mm. It's getting a bit cold. Uh, but what about you, Ken? This must be all completely foreign to you. You guys probably have like, what, 300 degrees Celsius up there still? Or? Oh, well, last week, yeah. This week we had quite a heat wave. So uh, this week has been like uh, 30 degrees, you know, probably 25 to 30 degrees cooler than than last week so it's it's a total opposite change so it's it's actually pleasant weather right now um and we're gonna we're, we might have some rain actually uh which we usually don't oh, wow. get tomorrow so it's just been weird hopefully, very strange hopefully you do get it hopefully you get some I rain hope we do we need we, those, uh, act, we need the rain so yeah to fill up go. those uh those uh, cauldrons full of water for your backup systems there <laughs> yeah <clears throat> we need a lot of it yeah so, before we get on to our topic for this week, we will first ask the usual question of the week, which is, anybody got anything new? Ken, I'm hearing through the grapevine that you have something new. Yeah, uh, I did get the, um, here it is. It looks very familiar because we've seen this kind of thing before, but this is the, uh, this is the Love Gun uh, colored vinyl oh, yeah. uh, anniversary. <laughs> Um, is it the anniversary? Uh, it's not. Yeah, forty mm-hmm. fifth anniversary. Um, this is the gold vinyl, and the gold is well. I don't know if you, <laughs> you would really call it gold, but uh, it's. I'll get it out of here. It's interesting kind. It's almost. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really it's, gold. Well, it's like flat gold or something. I don't know. Like a, almost like a yeah. odd gray. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. They added too much gray to it or something. I, I don't know. But anyway, <clears throat> that's their gold color one. Um, that's fine. Um, it, it but does, Ken, Ken, yeah. Ken, how many, uh, how many love guns do you have by now? Two, three, four. Oh, I have more than that. All <laughs> together. You have more than that. Four. Love guns. Oh, I have two, three, four U.S. copies. Uh, I probably have, oh God, I'm just looking right now. Yeah. Pro- probably somewhere between, probably around, uh, I would say somewhere around 15, close to 15. Oh, okay. That's, so that's a lot. We should, do an epi- we should do an episode when you go through some of your Kiss albums. We can we go through can some of them, yeah, and see the differences. Yeah. I can pull them out and just show yeah. some of the. That would be cool. Uh, this, this, they do, did include the, the, uh, Love Gun. Um, mm, and there, it's per, you know you can build it and play with it, you know. But, but uh, so and, and this is a variant too because usually this is a different color. Well, mm. last time I think it was like yellow or red or there's been a couple of different yeah. ones. So that's that's kind of a <clears throat> you know whatever 
a collector minutia thing for people. Only Besides a collector the, from Kiss would, would consider that a variant. It's yeah, that makes it a variant, and then of course the the color of the vinyl. That's where they. Otherwise, I think that they use on this one. They use the you know 2014 pressing. Yeah, the same plates. same master and stampers probably. Yeah, for that one, for this one. So anyway, that <laughs> plate. Sorry. That is it for <laughs> this week. I didn't get I didn't get any kiss related stuff, but I bought some tickets for a mini, a mini sort of. Uh, uh, it's a package with four or five bands. I think mm-hmm. you, Mark. I, I think you you might have heard of one or two of these bands: uh, Clawfinger, Evergrey, Hardcore Superstar, Nestor. Evergrey, yes. I think you've talked about every grade. Yes. Did you? Wasn't that one of your, your favorite bands out of Sweden? Yeah, I was very happy with. The, I, I like a lot of their stuff too. They came yeah. and played a couple times here in Toronto, and I was lucky to catch them once. So okay. they are very good live. Hard, hardcore that's superstar. A, that's a that's a hmm? great name. <laughs> yeah, hardcore superstar. It's like a sleaze sleaze rock and roll band. Oh, Pretty really? good. Hmm. But my favorites are Nestor. You know, they opened up for Kiss and I've, I've uh, heard in them, Stockholm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a fun band, and Clawfinger is like a rap metal band oh, really? that was really big in the mid '90s, and one of my favorite bands back then. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Very nice. Cool. Great. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily. Well, I did pick up one thing, but it's not new. It's just it was out, and I didn't uh, get it for a little while. I mean, I didn't get the show it last time, but I did pick up the CD copy of Donington, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, That's true. <clears throat> But I'm still waiting on my uh, purple vinyl of the Des Moines off the soundboard. Right. I did actually buy that surprisingly because I've, you know, yeah, I've been kind of I've been kind of buying the the CD stuff of yeah. these things, right? Uh, but I I, li- I like the Des Moines one, and plus it was a this one was a two LP. The Instead other one a... seemed to be a whole three LP, and they're pretty expensive, especially when you put the the shipping in there and then convert it to Canadian, and it's like just mm-hmm. insane how much these things cost. But I decided to get this one. Uh, I did check out some of the rec- the audio of the uh, Des Moines online, and it's a little bit more raw than the other ones, but I, I like it. I, I mean, I've, I'm so used to the 70s type soundboards where they start off, you know, with the volumes are a little mis- mismatch and they kind of level up as the set continues, right? Yeah. yeah, so I'm used to that. So, so I was looking forward to that. So, which one is your favorite? I mean, we, we've got four so far. We've got Donington, De, Des Moines, we got, we got uh, Tokyo, Virginia Beach, Tokyo, first. and yeah. Then we got uh, the what was the second one? The Virginia, Virginia Beach, Beach was second. Virginia Beach from '04. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then then Donington was third, and then the, this yeah. one, Des Moines, is fourth. So so far from what I've heard, the, easily the worst one is Virginia Beach. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah, I didn't sure. I didn't like that one at all. Uh, for for me personally, I think the one that sounds the best is Donington. I think Donington sounds excellent, right? But my favorite performance one is still easily Tokyo. I've always loved that lineup with Eric Singer and Ace Freely in the band. <clears throat> I, I thought that that was the right combination of really technical with Eric Singer and still a little bit of slop with Ace Freely in there. I think it, it, it <laughs> yeah, really it mix. mixed up well so, that yeah, way. Balance. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it balanced it out really nicely, I thought. And, you know, we got to hear songs like Talk to Me and stuff like that with Ace in there. Mm-hmm. So I th- thought, and and I did get that one on vinyl, that obscure bird poop vinyl one that came out. Oh, right? yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I got that one. I was pretty happy. Oh, hey, Shadow, what's going on, buddy? Well, will lay down. Uh, and, what about uh, you, yeah. Ken, then? Which, which one is your favorite? Um, Des Moines? Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> you know the class, the classic, the classic lineup. Classic uh, it's just because of that, and because of uh, it's around a li- live, t- live too. When I came in, uh, started get, you know getting into the band, so it's it's cool. I mean, it's the classic lineup. You can't go wrong. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go on. Okay. Well, uh, you know, and there's some things that I like on it um, that are you know, it's kind of more like a. Alive too. That's not been you know doctored and stuff like that. And, yeah. And it has my favorite version, or you know the style of Black Diamond that they do on it with the the, the nice intro that they do, or Paul would do before. Um, that they've not always they don't do it anymore really. Um, but 
yeah, it's a it's a real good verse on Black Diamond, which I which I like. So go ahead, Mark. No, I was just oh sorry, Daniel, did you want to say something? Oh. I just wanted to say I think three of the four are really good, uh, as yeah. you mentioned. Yeah, they're all the, the old four show was subpar, but but the rest are real good, and uh, I think it was uh, interesting that they picked the two two thousand and one show first, but. Uh, Mm-hmm. But uh, I also enjoy that one the most, I think. Yeah. Even though it's the classic lineup, the last one they released, I think that first one is kind of special because it's such such a short amount of time that lineup was active. True. So yeah, it's yeah. great to have. I've heard so much from the originals, but I do understand uh, that I, I love the, the talk from Paul between the songs <laughs> oh. yeah. when he was testing out stuff. Yeah. Fire! Fire! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, all kind of stuff. So uh, I really enjoy the last one. But I, I listen through Spotify. You know, Spotify is a Swedish brand, so I have to back oh. them up. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's a Swedish inventor well, what do you know? who came up with Spotify. And his name is Daniel as well. So, <laughs> well there you But go. unfortunately, it's not me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Me, you wouldn't be yeah. sitting here probably. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. I would. I would always be here. Okay, mm-hmm. that's good. So, I was just going to say that I'm actually very surprised that Ken picked Des Moines as his favorite one, considering that mm-hmm. it's the only one he did not buy on vinyl. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, get which is that. so rare. For I got it on Ken. CD though. Come on now. Yeah, but he I still might get it has, on vinyl. Yes, actually. he has 17 copies of Rock and Roll Over behind him, and 52 copies of you know Alive <laughs> too. But he, he passes on this right. one on on vinyl. So, but I, I have a feeling that he'll end up buying it eventually. Yeah, I, I, you know, I probably will. <laughs> mm, yes. Okay, so that's the one item done. We're going to move on now to a to a, a part of the show which has become pretty popular actually, and that is the comments part of the show. And now that we have our good friend Mr. Daniel back with us, who originated the idea of it, we'll give him full credit for that. Uh, He'll be the one to give us a few comments from last week's episode, which was five things that Kiss did right. So, Daniel, what have you selected for us? Well, I've selected five picks from from the the viewers, uh, or their picks, so to speak. Uh, I'll read you a few, uh, and then we can compare with what you picked. I wasn't on for this episode, but but I, I watched it a, uh, a week ago. Uh, so, Ro- Rome loves Dan. Mm. His number Mm -hmm. fifth pick is The Creatures Era. Then he picked the Marvel Kiss comic book. Mm -hmm. As number three, he had capturing the live energy of their early concerts on Alive. And in second place, getting Ace to sing lead vocals on his songs instead Mm -hmm. of having Peter singing them, I guess. And uh, number one, the whole makeup stage uh, alter ego personas, of course. And Mark G73... Ah, it rhymes. Uh, in fifth place, actually, Bruce Kulick. Uh, he ended mm. the revolving door of guitar players and kept them going until 96. Mm. Now, before unmasking on MTV in 1983, in third place, Reunion. Second place, Alive. And first place, Formation. Ace, Peter, Gene, Paul, Makeup, O'Coin, Bogart, Delaney. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Uh, yeah. There's a few picks from from the viewers, and uh, they have a question. Uh, also, Andrew's YouTube channel has been taken down? Question mark. That's you for an alien channel. Yes, I think it has been because of uh, the guy who's chasing every clip, kiss clip online, uh, mm. managed to close it down. The guy that sells those per uh, those uh, those purses, you know, Gucci. I mean, oh, Gucci. That's right. That's it. Never mind. <laughs> Gucci, <coughs> yeah. nice. And so, and, so, and Anthony Strait is he, he picked Vinnie Vincent. So some people might say he saved Kiss, and I guess he did a lot of good writing for them at least. Yeah, for sure. So that, that, that's a few from 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 the viewers, and keep them coming. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We we always uh, invite your comments. Uh, just really quickly, since Daniel did mention it, just a quick recap. My five were. Number five, the ongoing reissue campaign with all the colored vinyls. I thought it was a good idea. Number four was the 96 reunion tour. It was long overdue. Number three was the Hot in the Shade tour, the return to more classic songs in the set list. 
I thought was very important. Number two was the KISS convention tour, re-energizing the KISS fans and started the reunion buzz due to Peter's appearance in Los Angeles. And the uh, last one was Creatures yeah. of the Night, returning to so a heavier that, sound. Yeah. Number one, yeah. So, uh, but uh, hold on. You said the reunion was way overdue. When when would you have, would have liked mm -hmm. to see it start? Well, because you also... You also said 95 was a great thing they did there with the Well, convention. I was saying that what I meant was that it was long overdue for the, for the hardcore original people. Like they've been clamoring okay. for it for a long time. For me, mm. I mean, I think it I think it came out at just at the right time. Me because too. they were they were losing steam quite a bit after Revenge. Like people yeah. were kind of dropping off left, right and center. So, I think that the the convention re got people excited again because they got to see Kiss play like these uh, acoustic sets and they played a bunch of old songs and you got to meet them and get an autograph and they had that running museum where they had all the old pieces and stuff so people got re-energized about kiss in general and then when they did the mtv unplugged that sealed the deal and then it was pretty much a no-brainer from there mm -hmm. uh ken do you remember yours do you remember my list them up here i have yours here oh, so okay ken, ken Ken put down number five, number five was 1982 selecting Michael James Jackson as producer. Number four, he put the 1990 hot in the state, hot in the, the shade. shade, the stage and set list, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, number three was 1996, putting the makeup back on for the reunion. Number two was 1983, taking off the makeup. And number one was 1975, recording and releasing alive. Mm. Yeah. Thanks as well. All valid points for sure. Yeah. yeah. Now we will go on. I'm saying those can change from day to day. Obviously, uh, they, they did a lot of great things, and then based on those uh, those comments, you know, everyone has a little bit of different ideas of the best thing. Like you know, for selecting Bruce Kulick, it was the the one we just heard uh, mm -hmm. in the comments, and, and that that's a definitely valid point too. So. It's got to be on the list. I think it was a great topic you picked there because most of the time we Kiss fans whine <laughs> about the bad decisions or, or exactly. those things they don't do. But when you look back, they really made some good choices uh, yeah. Yeah. from time to time. They did. A lot more yeah, good than sure. bad. Yeah, yep. Yeah, but it's, it's just so much easier to find the negative and pick on that. <laughs> exactly. you know? sure. it's just, that's just the nature of the hum human being, right, to yes. do that. Mm -hmm. Um, next, we have a bit of news items to talk about really quickly. Hot off the press here. Uh, <laughs> so, number one, Creatures of the Night, the Creatures box set, the reissue that has just recently come out, has been reduced in price now on Amazon down to $265. Now, uh, considering it's like 300 bucks on many other sites, including with Kiss Online, unless you buy the bundle, uh, it's a bit of a drop in price. For me, it's still ridiculously high in my opinion for mm -hmm. a box set uh i know many other box sets that are around that are cost considerably less than that but there's also inflation to consider blah 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 uh thoughts on that uh let's start with daniel what what are your thoughts on the drop in yeah. price yeah i think they overpriced that one and maybe they might see that it is they aren't moving units like they thought they would so maybe it's because of that and I still think I don't remember the the price for the destroyer box set, but it was much cheaper, I think, wasn't mm -hmm. it? I think yeah, it was I much cheaper. It being and yeah. I don't see that there are a whole lot more on the creatures uh, box set, so I don't really know what, why they have chosen to to try to sell for that amount of money. Uh, uh, and um, I don't know. I'm probably not getting it. But uh, I do like the live recordings that we've already heard, of course, if we've been online. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to see if they manage to do something with those and make them sound even better. Uh, because it was really cool to hear almost full Creatures concerts and hearing, uh, hearing them fresh off the soundboard. I haven't heard anything in the vicinity of, of, of that sound that you heard on those recordings. And, of course, I like the demo that they released of that Vinnie Vincent song that Paul, yeah. you know, scat, scat sang over. So so mm -hmm. uh, I think it was kind of cool, 80s, 
a little bit of eight is cheese is never wrong. So uh, let's see what happens if if the price keep if it keeps dropping or, or if it stays there. Yeah, yeah absolutely it'll, can. It'll. Um, I'm sure it'll go down more at some point. Uh, maybe a, maybe a while. Uh, because you know, destroyer the destroyer box was down. To, in, I think they're around one hundred and thirty-one dollars at one time mm -hmm. on Amazon. Um, so I, I expect definitely I expect the creatures to come down to under two hundred at some point. So you know, it. I I don't know. I don't see it staying that high. I, it depends on I guess how many they, you know, produced of these box sets. I have no yeah. idea how many they created. Well, and I mean, what's interesting, Daniel brought, brought up a point saying that the two boxes, the, the Destroyer one and this one, that they don't mm -hmm. seem to be too different in what they have. They're not too different. And that yet the Creatures is so much more expensive. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Creatures box, though, doesn't even have any Blu-ray stuff, does it? No. I don't, I don't think, think it so. has any Atmos mixes or anything like that. So that's, in fact, something that they have less than the Destroyer box. So why is it more? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that could be a debate that'll be hours and hours long with people. So leave it in your leave it in the comments. What do you? Why do you think it's yeah. changed, and why do you think this has happened? Okay. Um, next bit of item news we have here. I, we should probably run through this quicker because I'm sure did, yeah, Julian doesn't want to have a three-hour episode on his hands. Yeah. Uh, Love gun picture disc has shipped. This is a big thing. If Lonnie was here, he'd probably be in shock because he was the one who was complaining about the fact that these things don't get shipped. To get, you know, he has to wait for one thing because he puts them together in bundles and, you know. So the uh, picture disc is apparently selling now. Uh, are you surprised, Ken, that it was so quickly after the announcement that it was delayed? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was like a week ago that Lonnie said he got the notice. Like a couple of days before that, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, going to be delayed. But, uh, and it, then it shipped the following week, I think, you know, so, um yeah, it's good that they got it shipped. I just, I guess they couldn't ship it out with the the gold one that I have here. Um, mm -hmm. It probably, if you, you bought all of them at one time, you probably would have got it together. But uh, yeah, it's a little delay. At least they, you know, it didn't take too long. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Daniel, what are your thoughts? Well, I think this shipping issue that we have is just global. <clears throat> it's a problem. Yeah. And I guess they've become a bit better on uh, from Kiss uh, has thought it through a bit more because they had some big failures. Oh my God! <laughs> <Jesus>. hey. <laughs> oh, hi there, uh, my youngest kid just mm. popped in. Okay, scared the <laughs> living daylights out of me. Oh, uh, but um, where was I? Yeah, the shipping. Um, well, it is what it is. I mean. It's a problem globally. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm um, I'm really hoping that they will sort it out because it's it affects you when you buy other stuff as well. So yeah, that's true. I that's don't know true. why it is rush over here. It's because of I guess Russia against Ukraine has messed up a lot of things. We have shortages shortages of different mm -hmm. kind of stuff and so <laughs> so on. So that's a big problem over here. I also think that it's also due to just the vinyl thing to begin with. I mean, there are so many things in line yeah. to get pressed. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. maybe the picture disc stuff was put was put in later in their order, so they had to wait for it. They wasn't able to get it bumped ahead. Who knows? So, but Mark, I have just a fast a fast question for you. A short question. Uh, we talked about creatures, the creatures box set, and and they are are they remastering or somehow remixing yeah. the. Yes. Uh, uh, the Creatures album. I just would like to hear your take. How do you think it would, will sound different than the previous releases? We have the, you know, the 82 original, and we have the one from 85, 85. and then I think they did one in 97 or something. The CDs, uh, yeah. remastered. What will yeah. the then 2014. What will the improvements be? Because, yeah, 14 as well. So that's something I really could... You know, I'm looking forward to if they can do something with it. But do well, you think they can improve it? Well, the one thing that I think that I'm curious to see about that is that they are releasing the half speed master version of it on vinyl, right? Uh, 
some people consider it snake oil. They think it's just a bunch of hooey. The, the, the half speed doesn't really do that big a thing. I think there is a little bit of an improvement with the half speed in the sense, but it, look, it, it's like anything. Do you like garlic in your food? Yes or no? I mean, it's just like that. Do you like the sound of the half speed? Do you not like the sound of it? I mean, for me personally, I, I didn't buy the half speed when I bought the, the uh, three record blue vinyl one with the bonus stuff on it. Uh, but as long as they don't touch the mix, I know that this is just a remaster that they're doing. I don't think there's a remix of it. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. they're just doing a remaster of this. And if that's the case, then I'm fine with it, as long as they use the proper tapes for it. Because mm -hmm. like in 2014, <clears throat> they screwed up and they used the one that was the for used for the uh, reissue that came out with the non-makeup cover. And yeah, everyone's saying, oh, it's just, well, it was only Creatures that was remixed. But, you know, overall, it just didn't sound the same. It didn't have the same emphasis. It didn't have the same boom to it. It didn't no. have the same power to it. So I'm hoping that they'll get that right and, you know, realize that when you have an album mm -hmm. called Creatures of the Night, it's got to have some power to it. And, you know, as long as they have the original tapes, I think that it'll sound pretty decent. Yeah. The, uh, Ken, you wanted to say something? Yeah, the... Uh, the the creatures hadn't had the original one pressed or on vinyl or on CD since, well, 97 was a remaster and that was a proper remaster. Mm -hmm. Uh, but 2014, they, they botched up and like Mark said, it was the 85 version. Um, they used the wrong, wrong one. And yeah. so, so this one is, they say is the real is the original, uh, album uh but it's remastered mm -hmm. um and the blue i think it's just remastered i believe the black single final half speed mastered that yeah. one that one is going to be a different bit from the blue um but i think it'll sound better to me a lot of half speed stuff well not all of it but a lot of it sounds pretty darn good at least the new ones that are half speed old time when they did half speed in the old days mm -hmm. didn't really improve but the half speed, the, they did Destroyer, I believe, half speed. The Destroyer sounds fantastic. It's one of the mm -hmm. best sounding that I've I've heard so of Destroyer. So uh, I think it's going to sound really, really good on the half speed single black vinyl that's coming out. Yeah. Good. So there you go. Uh, with that said, uh, Daniel, do you think that that would make any difference for you as far as getting it or have you got it or what's going on with you uh i don't know really i i'd like to have have a big improvement i don't know if i if there's something wrong with my ears because uh, at times when they release new stuff i don't really can i can't really tell the difference i'm mm -hmm. buying you know, the same stuff all over again I'm so against that so um, I, I don't have 15 copies of love gun for example no but, I have two, I think. <laughs> That's enough for me. Very good. Uh, but we're, we're we're all different. But but I'm kind of interested in hearing if they can because it's such a long time th since they remastered the album. I mean, '97. I don't know how long time ago that is. Twenty five, mm -hmm. <laughs> twenty five years or whatever. So um, we'll let you know. Well, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Okay, so the last bit of news, and we should get on with this real quick. Uh, Ace Freely's Origins Volume 2 is coming out on Picture Disc for Record Store Day. Uh, getting it, yes or no? Ken? No, no. I, I'm kind of done buying some of these Picture Discs. <clears throat> and then the Ace one, Origins. You know, Origins is not a big deal for me. It's not a major album or anything, or new, new music. Um, mm -hmm. and picture disc, or, I mean, I do it with Kiss more than the individual artists. Um, so no, I don't think I'm going to get it. It doesn't excite me at all. Daniel. Well, if Ken isn't getting it, getting it, I sure as hell ain't getting it either. <laughs> you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, there you go. So, uh, so that's, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I've personally never been really big on picture discs. The only artist I collect picture discs for is David Bowie. Mm. Uh, that's because I'm a big Bowie collector and I've gotten pretty much every, all of them that have come out of the newer ones. I haven't gotten any of the 70s ones and stuff like that. I don't, I don't 
not interested in those ones. But the new ones, I have gotten uh, a lot of the picture discs. So I'll get that. But I, I, like Ken, I'm not too interested in getting this picture disc either. I mean, I have the Origins 1 and 2 on vinyl, and I think that's good enough for me. So yeah. I'm going to just leave it at that. Yeah. Mark, yeah. are you looking forward to the to the uh, movie that's coming out then? If you're into Bowie, oh, the Bowie movie. Oh yes, yes. The yeah, the it's get, it's gotten great reviews over here in Sweden. I mean, five out of five. So it 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 seems to be an interesting film. I have watched pretty much every Bowie documentary that has been online that mm-hmm. I could put my hands mm-hmm. onto. I've watched yeah. tons of them, and I'm very excited to see this one. Uh, not sure if I'll go to the theater or just wait till it comes out, but yeah. uh, they are putting it in theaters here, so I might go out and see it. But yeah, believe me, one way or another, I will be seeing this. You should be going to the cinema. I mean, that's the way to watch these things if you have the chance. I think you should. Okay, do it. I'll definitely take a look at it when we get off here today and see what this. I'm so lucky. Are. I know. I know the guy running the cinema over here, so we have like private showings if you want. Oh, there just, you go. Yeah, just wow. bring your Blu-ray or sure. DVD and. And you play it. Nice. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I, well, if I had that kind of an advantage, I would definitely go and do it in a heartbeat. So good for you, Daniel. Let me, are you going to go see it? No. I, I'm no Dylan. <laughs> uh, I'm no, After all that, no. I want you to go to see it because you're a fan. Oh, okay. I've never I got really you. been into him, but uh, but I sure <laughs> will watch it when it you know, streams. But, but if you yeah. like the music, it's such a different thing to be at the cinema, you know with the great sound and all that so yeah. i I, gotcha. I think you should go i got you my friend okay so let's get on to the main topic we have only spent 40 minutes doing this stuff so i guess it's time to get on to with the main topic yeah but uh, mark i think i think it's a good thing i mean it's flowing we talk about whatever yeah, ends yeah. up it's hey. not that you know we, we have to talk about this we, we're kind no. of loose and free i like it i like it it's personally just a bit of a joke, actually, because I I know how much I know how Julian likes to be regimented yeah, yeah. in his one hours, and you know, so but, he's like, hey, you got to get this on this time and this time, and come on, guys, keep it one to this hour. time. Ju- Ju- Julian, Julian is not much into editing, not when it comes to shows, and not even his books. You know, they tend to be quite long, but well, good, editing. good long yeah. though, yeah, yeah. yeah. Long. Yeah, well, but, sometimes... I mean, but he doesn't like long videos like this. He no, likes his no. one hour, and that's people it, right? but... yeah. lose interest after a but while. We, we make sure we put in, you know, the times uh, slots so, so yeah. people know what happens, so they can. There you go. You know, you can skip forward, forward if they want to. Yeah. With, skip that, with that said, let us go on today's topic, and today's topic is Kiss Crazy Nights' 35th anniversary, 21st of September. 1987 this album right here came out mm-hmm. yeah. this is my bring my Canadian first final pressing that came out I also have a US one I believe as well it's a promo US promo yeah I think I have that one as well um, <clears throat> gold stamp yep. uh, I'm a big you know what believe it or not throughout the years i've become much more of a fan of this album to begin with i also have stuff like the touring itinerary this is the early one oh, nice That's good and this is the later one i both got them off of our good friend julian gill oh, uh okay. when he when we were at the kiss convention at the uh was at the uh rock and pod convention oh, i got it from him rock and, pod. Mm-hmm. and of course the, the uh, actual mm. resource for something like this which is danger zone by julian gill that. Fantastic read. If you don't own this book, smack yourself <laughs> in the head for being so foolish, and go out and grab it. If not, just Daniel. If, if not because you like the album, but you know to support fantastic authors like Julian Gill, who deserve our support. Okay. So it's not in the right language, though, for Daniel. No, but I mean, look, Daniel is a man of the world. He is global. He knows our language. He can speak yeah. English well. I'm sure he can read it pretty well. So, oh yeah, there you go. I'm much, so, be- I'm much better at reading than speaking. Speaking is the hardest part. You know, you don't have the time to come up with the words. I'm right. sure you know this when you try to speak German or whatever. Yeah, I don't exactly. know what other languages you speak. You know. It's not even so. Nine. I speak yeah. Slovak. I speak English. <laughs> Nine. 
uh, but uh, so with that said, my friend Daniel, yeah. what excuse do you have for not buying such a fine book? Well, to be quite honest, and I'm always honest with you guys, mm -hmm. I've read quite a few bad reviews of Julian's book. People saying that it's, uh, you know, feels like it's not really finished. Uh, but <clears throat> it seems like you guys have a different take on it. You think it's worth buying? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. for for me, the first thing about it I immediately got to is when I read and saw that Christopher Lent, which was the guy yeah. who was their main managerial, wrote you know, Kiss and Sell between. book, wrote the Kiss and Sell book. Yeah, best and, book and, ever. And I mean, he was the one who got fired during this tour. Yeah. I mean, right away, right there, it's like, I got to read what he said. You know, yeah. I mean, come on, like, right there. And plus it has, you know, you, you have all it. the musicians in there. Bruce Kulik. You have the producers. You have Bruce, Bruce mm -hmm. Kulik in there. I mean, and not only that, but I mean, you have all kinds of fantastic statistics. I mean, if, if you own his touring books, then you know how fantastic those little bits of information are. Well, you have all those kind of bits here for this tour. All right, so you can go mm -hmm. through the whole tour. He also has lots of little, well, not lots, because Ken uh, Julian's not much for photographs in his books, but he yeah. has like good little pictures in here and Song newsletters. Stories, and, you know. Yeah, there's look honestly, if you if you like his history and minutia, these kind of books are fantastic. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, I would say most more <clears throat> lot more people than not enjoy these books that <clears throat> Julian had put out. Um, yeah, there's mm -hmm. just a few people that probably don't I mean, come on, look at the, look at the, the Elder book. The, the, the yeah, solo album. the solo album book. Those, mean, are, those are great books. I mean, I'm a Kiss fan, I, and if you're a Kiss fan, yeah. you're going to love the yeah, book. Yeah, but when you read reviews, uh, I've read the others, uh, the Elder and the solo albums, uh, yeah. and they got great reviews. It, this didn't get the same reviews from what I can, can tell, but you guys might have convinced me. I might have to go and get that one as well and uh, it, read through it. It may have to do with the album itself sometimes, too. Might I have mean, to, yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's true. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm telling you, honestly, like this book is about 250 pages. Now, don't forget, I'll, there's a lot of it is the, you know, the, the, the concert statistics and stuff like that. But, you know, there's also a lot of great interviews in here and his interviews are fantastic mm -hmm. in here like i i can't tell you how many times i've read through his books and was like wow i did not know that or, or a person like me who loves mixing or does involved with you know audio production there's so many things that i get answered in these books so for me they're no brainer you know i go and get them right away so don't yeah. always believe what you read with, with no, reviews either you know the only criticism that i would give <laughs> and oh. so I probably won't be here next week. <laughs> no, um, uh, no, uh, that uh, I would. No, actually, I will not. There's no criticism. So I, I couldn't find the table of contents, and there it is. So I was just because there wasn't table of contents, but that was my fault, of course. So there's no criticisms. Um, but yeah, we were talking about Chris Lent, Phil Ashley, Diane Warren. Adam Mitchell, these are all interviews, people who were interviewed. Bill Turgeon, Tom Kelly, Gary Corbett, you know, the keyboardist, uh, mm -hmm. Bruce, Bruce Kulik, we said, Ron Nevison, the producer. Yeah. producer. Uh, and, and that sort of stuff. So th those are the main people, uh, people that were involved in the Crazy Nights project. So it's, yeah. you know, here are all their different uh, perspectives exactly. and, and how they were involved. So with that I said, I, 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 okay, let's no, go on. on. Go on, go <laughs> Which, on. I, I just, uh, <laughs> uh, I'd just like to say, when I speak to Swedish Kiss fans, they have read his books as well. But the most common criticism is people think you should get an editor. I mean, I've heard from so Julian, many. Julian people. has said that himself. That his he edits, that some himself. of his earlier yeah. books, you know, that he that's, needed an that's editor. That's the only critic. I mean, that's the only criticism I've heard, but I've heard it from several sources. So, so that might be yeah. an idea for future projects, maybe. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, people, let's put it this way. It's like smoking, okay? People say that they want to that's quit never smoking, good. but you have to be ready to quit smoking to do it, right? Just like an editor. He's like a writer. He's He wants to get the, the editor Something in the back of his head is saying to get an editor, but until he's mm -hmm. ready to do it, he's not yeah, going to do true. it. 
Right. So after all this uh, talking about that, um, you, you know, Daniel and I will probably never be on the show again after today. No. <laughs> Oh, come on. You guys didn't say that bad of stuff. But I no, think no. We, we've, we've always we been do. honest and we, we're no, we're no brown noses, no one of us. So we, we speak our mouth. I think he appreciates any mm-hmm. type of constructive criticism. I don't think he minds. If, you, if you're a no. Kiss fan, you should, you'll like it. It's, then you know, I need to get the... I'll buy the book, Julian, so you don't have to kick me out. You'll get my money. Uh, next yeah, that'll week. hold your spot. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So now that we've sold a book and we have yep. reviewed the book a little bit further, book, yeah. uh, let's start with our thoughts on Crazy Nights. So let's go to Daniel. What are your initial thoughts about Crazy Thoughts and the time period in general? What did you think of the 1987 time? But let's start with the album itself. What did you think of Crazy Nights? <clears throat> Do you mean when I first bought it or now or both? Or... Well, let's, let's start with when you first bought it. When I first bought it. Uh, I bought it... Um... I think only two months after it its release, I got it for my birthday, and I'm, my birthday is in November, so I got it fresh off the presses, so to speak, and uh, I was really pumped up because it was the first album, you know, that was released when I had become a Kiss fan. I got Asylum and Animalize in '85, but I hadn't, you know, anticipated their releases. But this time around, I have had waited and waited, and finally, it felt like it was a long, long time. But mm-hmm. looking back, it wasn't that long time between <laughs> Asylum and Crazy Nights. When you think about, you know, uh, Psycho Circus, Monster, Sonic mm-hmm. Boom, and times are different now. But a long wait, and uh, I had been reading about the album for years. It felt. I mean, they were waiting because. They were waiting to get the right producer, and you heard some some titles being thrown around. And um, finally, it was released. And I remember it vividly. I it was on my birthday. Me and a friend who was a Kiss fan back then put it on and listened to the LP from start to finish. And I remember immediately feeling a little bit disappointed because it strayed away somewhat from the Kiss albums that I liked. And by this point, it was Creatures, Lick It Up, Asylum, and Animalize. You know, when Kiss were mimicking the new wave of British metal, British Mm -hmm. heavy metal, maybe. Now it seemed like they were looking more at stuff like Slippery When Wet by Bon Jovi, maybe. Or even to a greater extent, the album from Aussie, you know, with Shot in the Dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ultimate Sin. I think it sounds a bit like that one. Um, but the keyboards are way up front. I felt there were too much keyboards. I don't mind keyboards, but it was like they put everything else in the background. The keyboards are really up front. front. So I didn't like the sound, I think. Um, even though I think the videos were but great. When it mm-hmm. comes to eighties videos, I think Crazy Nights, Crazy Crazy Nights is a great video, and even Reason to Live is pretty good. I mean, they have sort of a story, and uh, the live shots looks o- awesome, and uh, it feels like they have this big, huge show, which mm-hmm. they might have had for a f- few months, but then it was really scaled down when they came over here. So I was really disappointed. That was my first impression. Okay, so there you go. Let's go over to Ken. What are your thoughts? Um, well, I'm sure I got, you know, bought it right when it came out, probably the, the day it was available, uh, which is, I guess, September 21st, 87. Um, and, and Daniel was right about the two, you know, it was a longer wait because it was like two years uh, in between. Um, yeah. Because they waited, they were waiting for uh, Ron Nevison to become available mm-hmm. um, because that's what, you know, Paul wanted. So, um so I remember, I remember the album, I thought, it, you know, I thought, well, they, I was initially thought, yeah, it sounds like Crazy Nights is going to be a hit, just the, the way it was written and it sounded. It's a definitely single quality. Um, <clears throat> but I think, again, you know, it's just it's maybe because it's, it was too late um, in, in, in getting that sound because you're, you're kind of following that sound and it's already starting to pass by already. Um, um, 
jumping on the Bon Jovi or whatever, you know, bandwagon, Heart, uh, which is all ne- Nevison produced stuff, mm-hmm. all sounded the same pretty much. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was an attempt to to try to get a hit and, and match in sales at least what these other big bands were doing too. So, mm-hmm. but, you know, it's a good album. I, I, you know, we'll probably talk about it, but I listened to it again recently here. Um, and certain things don't sound too good anymore. <laughs> and there's certain other things that I probably didn't like as much. I like more now. Um, so mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. Well, I'll be honest. When I first got this album, uh, it didn't bother me. And I'll tell you why. Um, when it first came out, there was a big craze around here for like Bon Jovi, Slippery One, What, and stuff like that. That was a big, big album. Yeah. You know, and everybody and their brother was learning, you know, licks like, you know, You Give Love a Bad Name and, you know, all that stuff. So it, it you get so used to it. Even if you weren't like a fan of it, it was on the radio all the time. You know, your second friend, you know, like maybe not your best friend, but your other friend might go into his car and he might have it in a CD player. So you're kind of surrounded by it. So you become used to the sound of it. So when this album came out, it wasn't like, oh, my God. It was kind of like, oh, this it sounds almost familiar because of that production style. But, you know, as you become more of a diehard Kiss fan and you become more uh, critical of things and you start listening for more different things and when you become more involved in music like I I was, that was was still early days for me. Like, 87 was like, I had just done my first actual studio recording at, like, 16 years old at a 16-track studio. So it was still very early for me, the whole production end of it. But once I became more involved in it, then I started noticing the very shocking differences between some of the albums, like Asylum and this one, or even like Creatures of the Night and this one, right? So my initial thoughts of it were not bad. They were like, okay, this just sounds like something that's come out at, at the time. It sounds familiar. And that was... If it, if, it, if it was me now, transported back then, that would have been the thing that I would have disliked about it. Is that it just sounds like the things that were out and that were popular at that point. They weren't forging their own trail like Kiss were kind of known to do back in the day a bit more, right? You know, they, they weren't following as much as they were in the later days, right? So it didn't really bother me that much. And, you know, like I said, I think it has a lot to do with that time period. I was so used to the music of that time period. And... Ultimate Sin is my favorite Aussie album. Yeah. So, oh, wow. so okay. for me, that would have been yeah. like, oh, hey, you know. I'm like, surprising. <clears throat> oh, it shouldn't be because Jakey Lee is my favorite guitar player oh, okay. from Aussie, period. And I, I love that album. I think that album was a work of complete genius masterpiece, in my opinion. So, Mark, uh, what did yeah. you think of Red Dragon Cartel? It was called, yeah. Um,. <clears throat> It's okay. It's big comeback, you know. Uh, big comeback? No, I think it's not a no. disappointing in that light. If he would have just came back and said, "Hey, I'm back. I got a record out of being, yeah, it's pretty cool." But I think he hyped it up a bit too much. And the, honestly, I just don't think he had the right people for it. I mean, he could have gotten much better players. I think involved with, in that, right? But you know. I, I, is it, I, is I it like true that he wrote a lot of the stuff on Ultimate Sin without getting credit? Uh, well, the first, oh, the whole of Bark at the Moon, he got no credit at all, and he pretty much wrote ninety five percent of that, okay. along with Bob Daisley, right? Hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, Ozzy and Sharon were notorious for yeah. jipping people off in that. I mean, that was the whole reason why Ultimate Sin took a little while to get done, because Jake was like, "No, nah, I'm not going back in until I get some sort of agreement that I'm getting paid this time." You know, <laughs> good for him, right? Yeah. I'm not sure how that completely turned out, but, you know, he wasn't in a band much longer, so let's just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> how does the music stand up for you guys? <clears throat> uh, we kind of went over that a little bit, but let's let's go a little bit more in depth with this. How, do you, how does it, so this is more like, what do you think of the album now? How does mm-hmm. the music stand up? And pick a couple of favorites from the album. Let's start again with Daniel. What do you think are, what does it sound, what are your opinions of the album now? And pick a couple of favorites. I think the album is really stuck in in time, so to speak. It's it's in that period. It's in the hair metal period. And it's hard to, 
you know, some albums, you know, like Rock and Roll Over or Creatures of the Night, it doesn't really matter. They always sound good. But Creature, uh, Crazy Nights, they went f- hair metal all in and mm. a bit too much. And I think I, I actually tried to listen to the album as well this week. I listened when I rode the bike to, to, to work every day. But I didn't get through the whole album. Uh, I didn't get. Uh, I think uh, there are very few songs that stand out for me. The title track is great, maybe because I've heard it so many times in concerts, and I think it's a great live track. Uh, the current lineup have done it really well at times, and it always works well. I think it was kind of big in Europe. We know it went to number four in the UK, but people over here mm-hmm. seem to know it as well. So it works well live. So so I guess uh, that song has grown on me. So I like that one. But really, after that song, I have a hard time finding anything that really stands out. Um, I mean, they're pretty good. Uh, My Way with the over-the-top <laughs> vocals. There's a good som- song somewhere in there. But yeah. uh, uh, to me, the production is such a... I mean, it's a problem for me, and it all comes back to uh, keyboards completely taking over almost at times. Um, so, um, mm-hmm. ah, for me, I'd, I'd just say "Crazy Crazy Nights" is a great song, but other than that, no real standouts. I think "Reason to Live" is a decent, uh, you know, uh, ballad, but they've done a lot better. "Forever" or even mm-hmm. "Every Time I Look at You," I think is better. Thrills in the Night is somewhat of a ballad, maybe, and it's better. So, ah, Crazy Crazy Nights is a good song, but the rest, uh, I can only... I think Sword and Stone would have been my second favorite. Mm. They mm. didn't make the album, you know. Yeah. It was cut by Ron Nevison. Mm-hmm. Somehow, I don't know. And the worst song is probably Bang Bang You. I just have to mm. put that yeah. one in there as well. Yeah, hey, everybody's got an opinion mm-hmm. of it. And yeah. That's how it is, right? Ken, what about you? Yeah, um, you know, I think the, the the key thing with this album is the Kiss did what they did. You know, they forgot what they already fixed, and then they started to ruin things again, kind of. So it's kind of you know they they, they lost their way, and then they did the Elder, right? Got to the point of the Elder, and then Creatures of the Night came comes out, and they're they're very heavy again. And then they thought, okay, this is this is what they should be doing. So they, you know, they go creatures of the night, lick it up, animalize, asylum, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> this, you know, they didn't learn their they didn't learn their lesson as the type of music they should be putting out. Um, so this was, you know, kind of like I said, Paul's idea. But as far as uh, the music, um, yeah, it's not like Daniel says; it's kind of dated. It does have that '80s you know sound mm-hmm. from back then um some of the songs that you know i, I like about half of them um uh, more than anything else um of course crazy crazy nights is you know is is a good song great song um i find i'll fight hell to hold you is really good um one song that i didn't care for so much at the beginning it was surprisingly i guess maybe was no 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 but I like it a lot better now. I think it's actually a pretty darn good song. Where I thought, oh, it was okay back then. They were just trying to do do what some other bands were doing. But I really like that song. It's just, to me, now it sounds better to me than it did back then. Um, Hello High Water, um, I thought it was probably the best Gene song on the album. Um, and then uh, Reason to Live, you know, solid ballad. And then, obviously, Turn on the Night was a... Another song that, you know, became the third single. It should have been, to my, to me, it should have been the first single off of the album. Um, so that's about, about it. I don't like all the the high, my way, you know, song kind of high vocals that Paul Stanley's doing, you know, vocal anesthetics or whatever you're going to call it. Calisthenics. Uh, calisthenics. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of the wrong word. Um, calisthenics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just crazy. Uh, but otherwise, you know, again, there's some, again, some good, cool stuff on here. Um, not 
and it's probably lower on my list of their albums, you know, down my list of favorite albums. But, uh, I mean, it's not horrible. It's just the production is, is oh. yeah. you know, it's, it's, gotcha. not, it's not right for yeah. them. The sound's mm -hmm. not real, right real quick. Real quick, I just have to add two things I, I thought of when, when you were talking. Yeah. And uh, the first one is uh, there are a few good songs. Uh, you can hear that when you hear Bruce Kulick playing them live. You and know, he's great. Then they sound right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then uh, some of the songs become much better. That's the first thing. The other thing, is, I think, is when you talked about No, 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 I think it's quite interesting that they gave Bruce such, you know, uh, such Lead a way. playground, you, yeah. You know, he he, <laughs> yeah. he likes own. He, he he can you know do whatever he likes through the whole song. He gets the whole intro. They've never done it like that before, and no. certainly not with Vinnie Vincent. They try to you know <laughs> restrain him and 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 you know keep it down. And all of a sudden, here's Bruce. He's not been in the band that long, you know, young right. in '85, mm -hmm. and then he gets this room to do whatever he likes. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, well, it showed their belief in him. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, my thoughts on it are, I think that the album hasn't aged particularly well. I mean, it's not a bad sounding record, but it's definitely an album that's lumped in a time period where you can yeah. put it on and you can say, wow, this is for sure 1986 <laughs> or 87, you mm -hmm. know. And again, a couple of interesting points brought by both of my cohorts here. Uh, Daniel saying how when Bruce Kulick plays it's plays the material now live it sounds better like it should be, which points back to one important thing: it's the production of the album that hurt it. And lots of people said that, including Gene Simmons and including Paul Stanley, yeah. where the keyboards got pushed up way too high up in the mix. I mean, I heard at the uh, Rock and Rock and Pod convention they played a version of the album in the early stage where the keyboards were not pushed up at all in there. They're very much in the back. And it's like almost a completely different record. It sounded much heavier. It sounded much more not so Bon Jovi-ish in sound. Uh, and it's funny what a little bit of remixing and tweaking can mm -hmm. do to make an album sound the way it does. Uh, I think that there's some songs on here that I've always loved. I've always loved Crazy Crazy Nights. I've always loved Turn On The Night. Turn On The Night's been one of the songs I've talked about probably the most off of this album. <clears throat> That's such a strong memory for me. But the funny thing is there are songs on here that I was kind of like Blech, on before that have kind of came up in stature. Uh, Good Girl Gone Bad, I kind of surprisingly liked that a lot more than I ever did before. Hmm. And Hell or High Water, I think, is one of Gene's better songs on this album for sure. Yeah. Now, No, 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 I always kind of thought was kind of a throwaway song. <clears throat> but in recent years, I've kind of come to love it because, you know, as I've gotten better as a guitar player, I kind of was like, wow, Bruce did some pretty good playing there at the top. But another thing that helped is Chris Jericho and a couple of musicians, I think Charlie Benante and a few other people did a really good cover of it hmm. that you can find on YouTube. And uh, Chris Jericho sung it really good. I think the production of it is much more the way people would have hoped it would have sounded on album. Mm -hmm. I would I would I would advise people to go on YouTube and check that version out. It's really really good. Is it with uh, the quarantine? His uh, yeah know, like yeah his tribute thing yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I I think that it really shined a different light on that song particularly, and makes you wonder if quarantine were to have redone this whole record in that sort of thinking, mm -hmm. how would it have, how would it have sounded? Would it have been more to people's likings? Would have people said, wow, this is actually not as bad an album as I'm thinking, Yeah, you know? So, yeah, so that, that's kind of my, my thoughts on that. So next up is what would you have done differently for this record regarding the music or the album cover, or even the tour. So let's go back to Daniel on this. What would you have done differently on this album? I think the album cover worked when you were a teenager. I think it, mm -hmm. you thought it was kind of cool. Looking back, it's kind of you know a cliche, or or it's not a really a, you know original idea. But I think it kind of works. I mean, it's a lot better than a lot of the other <clears throat> album covers. We have 
the next one was really bad. You know, Han the Shade with the Sphinx on. on, on. Yeah. So I think it's a good 80s looking record. I, I like I, li- I like it. And of course, Paul's uh, underwear there is real <laughs> swell as well. Yeah. <laughs> real good looking. On. Well, we're too close. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, when it comes to how it sounds, well, of course, push back the keyboards more. Um, uh, pick different songs. Uh, you know, leave Bang Bang you off the album mm-hmm. put in uh, yeah. uh, sword and stone and i know paul was writing a whole lot for other artists at this point they didn't really pick up many of his songs but it had a few more songs that could have worked uh, so I, th- I don't know how they did the song selection for this album I- i'm sure paul didn't want sword and stone off the album maybe ron nevison um, you know yeah was the leader and picked and the, the, the ones he liked so that's a real you know um, I've always loved Sword and Stone I think it's mm-hmm. such a shame they didn't do it while Paul could sing it like he did back then because it was yeah. released by some other band and when Paul didn't sing on it it wasn't really it didn't sound as good yeah so uh, I don't I don't remember that band but yeah. Well, the, what's, what, what's interesting though is that there are a lot of songs written for this record. You have mm-hmm. like a song like "Are You Always This Hot," "Sword and Stone," "No Mercy," "Dial L for Love," "The Troubles Inside You," "It's My Life" was redone mm-hmm. once again. Uh, when two hearts collide, "Best Man for You," "Don't Let Go," "Jump the Gun." I mean, there is a lot of material that so was done for this time yeah, they jump the gun should have yeah time yeah. traveler should have been there jump the gun should have mm-hmm. been there uh and one or two of the others as well uh, especially it's my life that's you know when we did the best uh <laughs> yeah. songs that didn't make an album yeah uh, it's my life won on that episode, the kiss so, and the Q episode. B- before we go to ken what are, you, what are your thoughts on the tour i mean you, you mentioned something that was very mm-hmm. interesting that you said that the, they had a big show at the beginning, but when it came to Europe, they had really scaled it down. Now, did you see this tour? And if so, what were your thoughts? And what were your thoughts on the tour in general? I didn't see the tour. I was a little bit too young to to, to make it. But um, I know people who saw the tour. And uh, you have to think that this is, uh, you have to keep in mind that this is in the 80s and all the information we got was really from one magazine, and that was the UK magazine out of Sweden. I'm not sure if you, if you know it, but that was uh, what we, where we found our Kiss news. Mm-hmm. And they always had great photos from Kiss live with this b- big explosion. So I, I, I know a lot of friends who went through the show, and were really disappointed. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, where are the explosions? Where is mm. the big kiss sign? They thought they would bring that. And at least here in Sweden, they played real small places, only a few thousand people. Yeah. So I guess the tour at times is described as really successful, but I don't, I'm not sure. It was really long, at least. It was a long <laughs> tour, and they went through a lot of countries, and they even made it out to Japan once again. Um, and when you watch that show, I mean, the band is pretty good, but there's... You know, there's a good pro shot from J- Tokyo '88, but the show mm-hmm. is non-existent. So, so uh, I think a yeah, Kiss show, sh- you should have some explosions. You sh- that's part of Kiss live. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I think the tour was a letdown, and that awful concert from Philadelphia. They look so lackluster. It doesn't seem like they're into it. But maybe they were better at at at, at other in other cities. Uh, but they sure. Uh, got it right on the next tour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what's What's interesting is you bring up the tour, and you said that it wasn't really successful in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm looking at the num- numbers here, and the, the shows that they played here, they played at a uh, in Got- Gothenburg, Sweden, uh, and the attendance was only 4,500 people out of an 8,000 seat mm-hmm. place. Okay. Mm. Then they played in Stockholm, Sweden, at the uh, the promoter was EMI Telestar at the Estadion. Estadion? I believe That's close enough. 
Okay, <laughs> uh, nine thousand attendants maximum, but they only had six thousand people go there. Uh, it says that there is a pro shot of Love Gun from the back of the house, yeah. broadcast from TV Scandinavian Night Flight mm -hmm. special. Yeah, that's that. out there. And the last thing, I think there's one more here. I think. No, the other one is from Finland, where it was only eighty-two hundred people. In Norway, there was only five thousand. So yeah, the numbers were much smaller, obviously. In uh, places like that, uh, in Japan, when they where they played, the numbers were probably a bit better. Yeah, sixteen thousand for uh, Castle Hall, Osaka, Japan, and Nagoya there was ten thousand. Uh, Budokan there was uh, April twentieth they had five thousand, and Budokan on the twenty first they had fourteen thousand. So the numbers kind of varied a bit here, and then the. Uh, Yo Yoga Olympic Pool in Tokyo. Uh, it doesn't have the numbers here for that, but you know, Japan, they've always done fairly well. And the numbers yeah. in America were not that great either. I mean, you look here in uh, Indiana, they had 3,400 people. This one, look at this, a terrible Peoria, Illinois. Uh, maximum attendance is 11,000, and they only had 5,000 people show up. The next night in, in, in Winnipeg, there was 12,000 seat arena, there was only 5,000 people show up. You know, and a lot of people were saying too that that the that the shows themselves were very uninspired. Like if you look at the show that he did in Philadelphia, I had the full show of that on VHS tape. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, on Kissology, they only put a part of that show on the DVD. Because if you watch the whole thing, it's pretty apparent that they were not interested at all during that show. They, it's like they wanted to just get the hell out of there. like, And that's Philadelphia, one of the hot spot mm -hmm. places for a kiss. Now, another complaint for this tour was they were only playing between 65 minutes and 75 minutes. And that was it. They were only playing the yeah. minimum amount that they were contracted to play and getting the hell out of there. So obviously, they were at a very low point in their career at that point. You know, so... It's very interesting that how this tour was going. Now, Ken, I didn't forget about you, my friend. No, what are your thoughts on <clears throat> the uh, music? Of, and the, what would you have done differently with the cover or the tour, etc.? Okay. Well, well I, I mean, Gene was right where he was. He didn't. He didn't want to go this. Have this kind of production. He wanted to mm -hmm. keep it rocking. Um, but he, you know, he fell in line and was a team player and, and you know, <laughs> did what Paul wanted, right? Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I would have had a, definitely a different producer. It wasn't the right producer for them. There was a lot of the great producers out there at the time that they could have chosen and had a, a great rocking album. But, you know, they, they made a mistake again, obviously, uh, with the production. Um, but um, if we're changing, what would I have done differently? The album covers... You know, perfectly fine. The back, you know, nowadays, uh, the Paul Stanley, I would have said, you know, pull up your pants, maybe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> pull up your pants. Pull up your pants. You don't need to do that, you know. Come on. But whatever, you know, that that's fine, whatever. Um, and then uh, it's it's more about, you know, just the music. The production is, is the key thing uh, with this whole album. Um, you know, there's some great songs there. That could have been a lot better had they been produced in a different way and s sung in a lower register voice, you know. So that's what the album. That's that's for the tour. I agree with you. I was there. I went to the mm -hmm. San Francisco Civic Auditorium, which is a smaller place. Usually they were playing places like out here, which is like Oakland Arena uh, or or the Cal Remember Palace. Remember the date. Do I remember the date? It's in the book. <laughs> I can't remember it off. Off. It uh, could have been I'll, I'll look. April I'll look. or something. Continue. But anyway, um, it's in there. Um, and it it wasn't full. Uh, you know that that place. It's smaller. It, it didn't sell. You know, sell out or anything. Um, but the same way uh, Daniel was talking about some of the things. Uh, yeah, it was it was kind of lackluster. They, it seemed like they weren't really into it as much as they normally are when you see them. Um, and the shirt, the set, 
set list was shorter. It was a shorter show. It seemed like they just wanted to, you know, get in there and get out kind of thing. Um, they performed fine. Um, yeah, stripped down. The stage wasn't anything to be excited about. Not a lot of, you know, like Daniel said, explosions and, and this and that um, going on. Just went through it real quick. Uh, it was the it was the my least favorite Kiss show out of all Kiss shows up till now. My least favorite. I mean, it's the one that just always stands out to me as there's something wrong here. I mean, when I left the concert, I thought there's you know this is, something's missing. Um, so, you know, even the hunger or something. But obviously, they were in, you know, the money wasn't doing well. They weren't doing well selling uh, uh, places, um, selling arenas or anything out. So, uh, yeah, they were kind of in trouble. But they weren't helping themselves by putting on a lackluster, a little bit of a lackluster, you know, performance uh, for the concert payers or whatever. So, um uh, anything else differently, you know, nothing else is different. I mean, we went over all of that. So in the tour, like I said, um, my least favorite tour, uh, seeing, seeing Kiss live. So it says here, you're saying you saw him in San Francisco, right? Yes. Okay. So it's March 30th, Civic Auditorium. Uh, March it says here, presented okay. by Bill Graham. Opening act was Anthrax. Yeah, Anthrax. On this. Uh, it says <laughs> didn't go, they don't go together. <laughs> It says here the local review was two years ago kiss played the cow palace show which was half empty <laughs> wednesday night it was even worse with a much smaller attendance at the civic auditorium with only two-thirds full but kiss hangs on saying things like we're here to kick your motherfucking ass says paul stanley his first <laughs> words on stage <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so apparently there was they were vulgar and silly but that's much of a rock and roll apparently yeah. Uh, there was no fireworks. Uh, the fire. It says, okay, here we go. It's interesting here. Uh, some years back, Kiss dispensed with the white makeup they used to wear, and on this tour, possibly concessions to the fact that they were not making as much money th that as they used to. There was no fireworks, fire-breathing stunts, or bombs going off at the end of the songs. All that's left is four letters with saying "Kiss" in lights on the back of the stage. So mm -hmm. it was really stripped yeah, down pretty even much then. It. <laughs> Talking about Ken attending concerts, aren't Kiss coming to your neck of the woods pretty soon? Oh, well, they are playing uh, what they call the Aftershock Festival yeah. or something like that in uh, Sacramento, which is, you know, about a, uh, over, over an hour away. Um, but I'm yeah. not I'm not going to go to it. Um, it's it's not the same kind and of environment. And you call yourself a Kiss fan? Well, I, I know you've seen them, them so many times. The main but, tour, but, but that that one is going to be a, just a big mess, and it's not. They're not going to have their. Well, they may have their stage or part of it, um, but uh, usually... I just have to tell you. I mean, I went I went to see them a few months back, and it was awesome. But then it was you know a sold out arena, and it was their show. It's somewhat different when it's uh It's their show and a and a and a package thing is is different. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I saw them three years in a row. You know, twenty you know, so. last year, the year before, and the year before. So I've, I, it's not like I hadn't seen them recently. So, okay. yeah, <clears throat> very good. So it is interesting looking back at that because you know that was one thing that was kind of shocking to me was that whole no drive and desire because. If I remember correctly, Gene Simmons has always said that no matter what the situation, whether it's a club or a big show, we mm -hmm. always give our fans 100% and the best show that we could possibly do. Mm -hmm. Apparently not for crazy nights, though. But, uh, you know, hey, look, at, I'm not going to bust their balls. They were going through management issues. They're going through financial issues. Hey, Paul Stanley, they waited two years to get this record done. Mm -hmm. In between then, Paul Stanley, you know, the electricity was turned off at his house because they were so far behind on bills and stuff like that. So <laughs> it was an easy time for them. You know, you can read all this stuff in books by, you know, Ken Sharp and all these people. So you can, this is not just me making shit up. It's out there. It's documented. So it was a tough time for them. So, you know, ask yourself, if you were a touring band, you know, and just the tour before that, just to make things level out, they increased the ticket prices by two dollars, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you increase two dollars by, you know, five thousand people, 
that's extra money right there, mm -hmm. right? So to try to even things out, but even that wasn't helping at this point of the tour. So, you know, it's, it's frustrating. You know, they were they were supposed to get excited about playing to, you know, a sold out seven thousand seat place where they were playing to like you know double or three times that years before. Mm -hmm. So it's tough, you know. Now, the, the one of the last things that we're going to talk about as far as creatures of the night goes, a creature of crazy nights goes, mm -hmm. is do you think this album is worthy of a deluxe box set version, similar to Destroyer or Creatures of the Night? So let's go to the optimistical man, the man who will see Kiss do no wrong, <laughs> Mr. Mr. <laughs> Ken. What do you think, Mr. Ken Keenan? Do you think <clears throat> that this album is worthy of a deluxe box set? Um, yeah, I do. Um, not quite as big as Creatures or, or Destroyer, but there's a lot of leftover material uh, that they can add here, you know, unreleased tracks that they've demoed or it, they just didn't, you know, didn't make the cut. Uh, there's a lot of cool songs um, that they wrote or and uh, created. So, yeah, from the standpoint, but what I would do is I wouldn't make it as crazy, <laughs> that's the wrong word, but as um, <clears throat> crazy like oh that's what that, well let me just go back one of the things i would have changed uh, for the crazy nights album cover is i would have been cr crazy spelled crazy with a k on it to me it was obvious they i mean come on k kiss they should have done it it's just spell it with kiss a k kind of like kiss story all that stuff they should have put a k but anyway that's just something that i thought they missed um but box set, what I would think is remastering it, right, first. Mm -hmm. I would also create on another disc a remix edition, mm -hmm. which would remix it, bring it, you know, bring the guitars forward, put the keyboards back, you know, mm -hmm. try to give it a more harder edge uh, of an album. I think that would go over right. big time if they did that on this album. I think it would, I think it would sell if they did that. Um, and then another disc, which is the, you know, outtakes and demos, other, you know, all the other unreleased songs uh, on that. And then probably one uh, live, uh, like maybe Japan or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> like, pro, you know, a uh, soundboard kind of thing yeah. on that. And then mm -hmm. yeah, they, they could do some other stuff with it. Uh, I, you know, they still have a press kit and a book and stuff like that, but it's not going to be as much, I don't think, extra. Song stories, you can still do all that stuff as they do in the same box set, but I don't think they can put as many trinkets and other stuff uh, and maybe lower the price a little bit. <laughs> and and yeah. uh, I think I think it could work. I think that would be a, a decent a decent box set. I, I definitely would, you know, get it if they did that. Hmm. Interesting. What about you, Daniel? Uh, Ken uh, has a lot of good ideas. And the one thing I feel is that the, I'd like just a single disc, a remix or a remaster or both. That's what I need. Mm -hmm. I don't really need a box set of, of the material. Of course, it would be fun to see what they got in, in the vault. But before they release Crazy, a Crazy Night, Night's box set, they can release any box set from the 70s or True. the other 80s albums, or Revenge. I'd rather see that than a Crazy Nights box set. Uh, uh, when it comes to albums, I only rank like Hit, Hot in the Shade, Lower, and maybe Monster, and Psycho Circus, and maybe Sonic Boom. But then it's Crazy Nights, and that's, you know, the bottom records for me. So, of course, we always like to see the extra material, the, the the demos, the leftovers, and and all that, it's fine. But I'd rather see a lot of other box sets before this one. But there are a lot of material. But what, what we do need is a remix, a remaster of the album, so it sounds like, you know, more like a rock album than than you know keyboard synth pop. That's Agreed. it. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I kind of like both ideas what what i'd like to see if you're going to go down the route of doing a deluxe box for this you have to definitely do something that's going to really make people sit up and go whoa okay now now you got my attention number one 
uh, a remix of it it will definitely put people's ears you know perk it up a bit going okay well now now there's something i'm interested in here to hear a different mix of this album in a way that maybe i thought it should have been but another thing I, and i and i know i know i've mentioned this quite a few times before and one album that i think would benefit from that is this one is put in some more video like not i don't mean concerts necessarily because we know how poorly the concerts did maybe it might not be good to show them at their you know <clears throat> depressed state playing but why not do some video of rehearsals or her rehearsal footage mm -hmm. of them performing preparing for it you know or footage of them working with ron nevison in the studio when they were you know optimistic about the album and excited about it you know or and, and then you know put in these bonus tracks of these unwritten you know or unreleased songs and <clears throat> stuff like that if you're going to put a box set together it has to be more than just you know, trinkets and, you know, press kits and stuff like that, because there's a certain amount of people that are going to be interested in that, but other people are not going to be as much interested in that as they might be as, you know, seeing what's happened behind the scenes, you know, maybe seeing video. People like video, especially if you put it onto Blu-ray and stuff like that. You know, there's a Blu-ray video of them, you know, preparing at, you know, SIR, the, the full production, the early full production mm -hmm. stage. I'd be interested in seeing that, you know, or hearing them play some of these songs that they maybe didn't end up on the tour. Maybe they maybe they rehearsed songs that never even made the set list. You know, these are the kind of things that I think people want to see and are probably kiss are missing out on as far as that in, goes. In addition to that, you you could also put a lot of focus on Eric Carr because I know mm -hmm. he had a lot of yeah. demos for for this one. So. Uh, put that in there as well, and it might sell a few more copies. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that there is a way to make all these kind of box sets sell if you just kind of think a little bit outside the box a bit more. I mean, yeah, it might take a little bit of work to 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 find some of these things. And yeah, maybe it might take an extra dollar or two to convince some people to release the rights to some of these things. But you know what? It's... It, it could be worse. Like we just talked about the pro shot footage from, from Sweden that showed them playing Love Gun. You know, find the footage for that and put it on the on, on Blu-ray. You know, I mean, people are interested in that kind of stuff. Look at, look, we've went down this road a hundred times with the leaked, you know, footage that's out, you know, from, you know, Mr. Loomis there. <clears throat> but look at the interest that that just peaked on that kind of stuff. Imagine Before, if they yeah. found properly recorded pro shot stuff and they put it together and released it i think you'd have a winner there you know so yeah. any uh any final thoughts on this record before we head on off well for me uh you know it's a decent album there's some there's some flaws in it obviously and it's dated but uh even though even with that uh I listened to it the other day, and you know, I enjoyed listening to it. I didn't skip anything. I, I listened to the whole thing, and uh, uh, there were some songs again that stood out for me that uh, that I thought were better than I originally thought they were, and stuff like that. And it's it's a it's a decent album. They could have done better on it, yes, um, but it, it you know it is what it is. Uh, there's some there are some classics on there, the Crazy Nights and Turn On. I mean, just great songs right yeah. well written songs you can't go wrong with it um it's just you know we're, of course we're doing the nitpicking uh, of little things but mm -hmm. uh in, in general it's a it's an okay it's an okay album but not not one of their best daniel uh, i just have to underline that uh, it's a poor sounding record uh we need that remix and remaster um and by doing that, we might finally hear what the way it's supposed to be heard, you know, the way the way it's supposed to sound. And keep in mind, Bruce Kulik could do a lot with these songs live. So a uh, brand new remix of the album might do something. Uh, but as it is of as it is now, I think it sounds it's uh, it's a poor sounding album. And mm. uh, that's what stands out for me. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, I would probably agree with that. It's in dire need of a remix. 
and uh, I think that's the main thing that's preventing people from giving it a better opinion of it is just the sound of it. Because again, that's a, that's what you normally hear when you talk about this record. They were trying to follow trends too much. It sounds too much like this or too much like that. You know, if Kiss just did what they felt in their gut was the right thing to do, I think it might have been a much better uh, performance or a much better final product in the end. So before we go, I'm going to just ask you guys one really quick rapid fire thing. Mm -hmm. We've talked about box sets, the deluxe box sets. So for the sake of record keeping here, Daniel, what do you think is the next deluxe box set that's coming out? Uh, the one I want is uh, a revenge box set, but I'm not sure that's the one. Uh, I guess they go for some 70s record, but I, I would like to see what they could do with a re revenge box set. Uh, mm. And I know Bruce Kulick has a lot of stuff from the recordings of, of Revenge, so that would be real cool to hear. So I'm 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 really hoping for for a Revenge box set. Ken. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I I I, I would like their their first album to be uh, have a box set of the very first album. Um, though I do agree that Revenge it could be picked next. Because it's one of, you know, the core Paul Stanley favorites, you know. He likes Destroyer, he likes Creatures, he likes Revenge. Um, so it, it may happen. It, revenge may happen. It would be, you know, and it would still be good. Um, but uh, I, I would pick another, definitely another 70s album, if not the first album. Something else in the 70s. Interesting. Uh I mean, I, I love a lot of these records just like you guys do, but if I, I, I don't know, something in the back of my head is nagging at me and talking to me saying that the next box set that might come out, and I could be completely wrong with this, mm -hmm. there's going to be Dynasty. I, I think that th there's going to be a look at that because, you know, there is a lot of stuff floating around about that. There was a, that was a big, that was their big return, Kiss Returns, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so there was a lot of, uh, footage of them, you know, preparing the stage and this and that and the design of Paul Stanley's lighting system that he came up with. And, you know, th there could be a lot of things that, like I could see the minutiae of that, you know, inside the box. We have Paul Stanley's original drawn designs for the lighting grid and this and, you know, like all kinds of this little minutia I could see. And, you know, it's not a bad record. It did sell. I mean, if they did a remaster of it again, that, that could be fine. You know, if they if they got somebody to do a 5-1 of it, that could be pretty cool too. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I don't know why that is, but whenever I think about this, I keep thinking that they're going to go around somewhere around that era. I could be totally wrong, but that's what I'm guessing. You might be right. <laughs> so that's uh, pretty much it for today. I think we went over a lot of stuff today, a lot of material yep. for Daniel, for uh, Daniel, for Julian to <laughs> look at and, and listen to and, and enjoy. Uh, and I'm sure that everybody out there will enjoy the episode as well. Uh, again, of course, please leave your comments. We enjoy reading them. We enjoy talking about them. You know, were we correct about our views on Creed Crazy Nights? What do you think differently on the album? Also, talk about some of the earlier things, you know, uh, what are your thoughts on the picture disc of Ace Freely's Origin 2? Or, you know, that Love Gun picture disc is shipping now. What are your thoughts on the dropped price of the Creatures box set? Uh, we want to hear you from you guys about all this and much, much more. So leave your comments in the section below. And until next time, on behalf of Daniel, Ken, and myself, we thank you for watching, and we'll see you all again very soon. Bye for now. I'll get that book, Julian. <laughs> thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.